Hello folks, my name is Chris Gregory. This is my son Cody Gregory. We're in Heartland Horseshoe School here in Lamar, Missouri. Um, been here for a long time. Today we decided to do a dissection video for you. So Cody and I thought uh, we'd undertake this little endeavor. Hope you learn a lot from it and uh, let us know what you think. Cody's going to start out with some definitions of anatomy and anatomy is like another language so knowing the terms and, and how they're defined is very important. With the anatomy that we deal with as horseshoers, what we're going to be talking about most is the appendicular skeleton. The appendicular skeleton is going to consist of the limb, from everything from the scapula down and the pelvis down. Now, we're going to separate that once again, and we're going to consider another portion of this anatomy, the leg. And the leg is going to be everything from the knee or hock down. Now, when we're talking about the terminology, what we're going to use is words like cranial and caudal. Cranial is going to mean towards the cranium and caudal is going to mean towards the back. Once you get below the knee or hock you're going to be using dorsal for towards the front and you're going to use palmer for towards the back of the front limb from the knee or knee down. Now if you remember that just like the palm of your hand, palmer is going to be there. Anything distal of the hock forward is going to be dorsal and everything towards the back is going to be plantar just like a plantar wart on the bottom of your foot. Now, if you were to draw a line down the center of the animal, any, when you go towards that, that'll be towards the medial, and away from that will be towards the lateral side of that. Now, anything closer to the center of mass is going to consider proximal, and everything further away from the center of mass is distal. Now, when we talk about each particular bone, each particular bone is going to have an area that is dorsal or palmar or proximal or distal. So let's take this cannon bone, for example. If we were to split this cannon bone down the center here, everything towards the center of mass is going to be proximal and everything away from that is going to be distal. So this bone has a proximal and a distal end to it. Now that we have some of the terminology, we're going to have uh, a discussion about the, the skeletal system, about the bones. So this is the framework that the, the horse's muscles, tendons, ligaments, everything runs on. So you can think about a skeleton as a biomechanical frame and the uh, muscles and the tendons as the cables that pull it, kind of like a crane would work. So now bone is, is very dynamic. The oldest bone in your body is only five years old. So it's always being broken down on a molecular level and then being replaced on a molecular level. So it's not like your humerus went missing for a week. Basically, there's something called an osteoclast that comes in and tears down bone tissue and osteoblast comes in and rebuilds it. So the bone changes for whatever's happening to it. And we see this whenever we, uh, we take apart bone. So you can see how this bone has quite a big bulge on it, this cannon bone. Um, bones that are in crisis, they have a lot of change. You know, you can see here we had a, a broken humerus on a donkey and it uh, healed. This is his other one. He drowned, so we later got the uh, specimens. But look at how, how much that changed, how dynamic that bone is. It's a pretty incredible structure. So the parts of the bone, if you draw it like this, this is just, this is not any particular bone, this is just a generic piece of bone, but it's easy to remember from the, from the top down or the outside in, however you want to do it. We have articular cartilage on both ends of it, whenever you're talking about synovial joints. The uh, skin around the outside is called periosteum. The periosteum covers the cortical bone or the hard shell of the bone. The inside of the bone is hollow and has something in it called um, cancellous bone and bone marrow and then it is lined, that medullary cavity on the inside is lined with endosteum. Um, it gets nutrients through a hole called the nutrient foramen. And then the bone is divided into sections. You have the epiphysis, which is outside of the growth plates or the physis. And then you have the diaphysis in the middle. The growth plates that are in a bone, they close at different, different times for different bones. But if you, if you boil out a horse that is, is younger than the growth plate closure time, then these growth plates will come apart like so. And then if you, if you look at this long bone, there is an epiphysis up here, and this epiphysis is coming off where that growth plate is. But uh, this epiphysis on the proximal end of the cannon bone usually closes at birth or, or very close to it. Then we have something where a horse has a, a problem with bone, and so this is called epiphysitis, and you can see how there's a, a swelling there, and, and uh, we're starting to have some difficulties in that area. And epiphysitis means an inflammation of an epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. All right, so um, here's a tibia that we cut so that we can see the cancellous bone getting into the medullary cavity. And this cancellous bone, the way that, the way that matrix is, 
It's actually designed so that it uh, can absorb a lot of power and force. Very incredible. You can see here, as we cut closer to the end of a bone, you can see the, the structure of the cancellus bone. And there's just the hollow middle of the uh, cannon bone and how, it's, how the medullary cavity is empty. All right, sir. So now we have talked about bones. Let's talk a little bit about joints. There are three main kinds of joints. Um, for us, we're very interested in articular or synovial joints. Anytime a bone touches another bone, we have a joint. If you talk about between the vertebrae, those are called cartilaginous joints. If you talk about where splint bones hit the cannon bone, like right here, that's called a ligamentous joint. The ones we're really interested in are synovial joints. Synovial joints are surrounded by something called a joint capsule or capsular ligament. They have articular cartilage on both ends of the bones that come together, and then they have synovial fluid on the inside. There's a lot of categories of synovial joints. The three we're really interested in are the ball and socket, which are also known as anarthrodial joints. So <clears throat> here's a femur, here's a pelvis, and if you look at this, it's not nearly as dramatic as you might have thought it was. So even though it is a ball and socket, it's not like a ball on your pickup and the socket on the trailer. It is, the, the, the more that would encapsulate that, the less movement that horse would have. But it's even more so on the thoracic limb. So you look at the distal end of the scapula here, and then the proximal end of the humerus, and it's just pretty unbelievable um, how much ball for how shallow our socket is. First time I saw that, I was quite surprised. And in the live model, you actually have uh, much more distance between that joint than you might imagine. You'll see that in the textbook if you look. Okay, so as we get down the leg, we, we're going to have um, ganglimus joints. Probably the best example is going to be your fetlock joint. So our fetlock joint is between our distal cannon bone and proximal P1. So uh, that joint moves in only two directions, so it's called a hinge joint or ginglimus joint. And then finally we have the arthrodial or plane joint. So this joint here is the distal joint of the carpus, and it doesn't open when the knee is flexed, so the bones on top slide, and that's considered a plane joint or an arthrodial joint. So those are synovial joints and the three types and a couple of examples. Um, Codeman, if you'll take it from there, you can do Wally's upper limb and talk about his, uh, his bones and joints up there. We're going to talk about the thoracic limb. And the cool thing about the thoracic limb is the fact that it's not held to the, to the horse solidly. It's all held by muscle and tendinous tissue. And the main muscle that is part of that is the stratus ventralis. So you can see I can run my hand all the way up in between this, this thoracic limb and the and animal. Now, to remember my bones that lead up to the carpus, the way I'm going to remember them is the acronym SURE. And that is going to be scapula, our humerus, our ulna, and our radius. Now, when we think about this, it's important that we also know how to draw this in a, in a very accurate kind of way. For me, if I can mechanically understand that, it makes it much easier for me to, under, to, to draw that. Now, when we're naming joints, for the most part, joints are named after the bone that is directly above it and just below it, just proximal and distal. So right here, we've got our scapula and our humerus. This is going to be our scapula humeral joint, okay? Now we're going to have our humerus and our radius, and that's going to be our humeral radial joint. Now that's going to lead us right up to our carpus, and Dad's going to take it from there. Okay, so the carpus is on the thoracic limb, as Cody was talking about. And for us, if you think about our anatomy, our scapula, humerus, ulna, radius gets us right down to our, our, our wrist. Our wrist is our carpal bones. So for the horse, scapula, humerus, ulna, radius gets you down to his carpus, which is what we call his knee. So the radius comes in and hits the top end of the carpus, and the carpus on the top row has four bones that we have named. This one's called the accessory carpal. It sits palmar to the carpus and does not bear weight. It is the insertion for uh, ulnaris lateralis and the flexor carpi radialis, and so it, um, it does help keep the knee extended, and it's a very important bone, but it does not bear weight. This bone here that you see from a lateral view, this is the off front. The horse is pointing that direction. This bone is called your ulnar carpal. As you turn it, you can see your intermediate carpal. You turn it again, and you see your radial carpal. Now, if you look at this, this is a very cool thing to understand. Because of the shape of the distal end of the radius, and the way these bones are, are oriented, as this bears weight, 
those bones are pushed apart. When they're pushed apart, that redirects force, it redirects concussion, and it makes it, you know, the design of a horse is just phenomenal. Not just the joints, not just the bones, but look at the foot, the foot, what the foot can do. We're going to talk about that a lot more later. It's just, it's an incredible design, and every little thing like that becomes important. Where the radius hits the carpus, as Cody said a minute ago, if you just say radius and carpus fast, you're close. It's called the radiocarpal joint. Between the two rows of carpal bones, you have another joint called the middle carpal joint. Some books call it the intercarpal joint, but in reality, each one of these joints is also an intercarpal joint. So I don't like that term, but mid-carpal or middle carpal joint works really well. The bottom row is numbered. Whenever you have numbered anatomy, the medial numbers are smaller, the lateral numbers are higher. So when I turn this, now the horse is facing me. That's the lateral side, this is the medial side. So this bone would be second and that bone would be fourth. This bone above it is going to be your second carpal. So if you turn it, there's your third carpal. And then above that side is your fourth carpal. Occasionally C1 or the first carpal is present and it'll be on the medial side. It's very small. It'll be like the end of your pinky right there. Okay, so between the carpus and the top of our cannon bone and splint bones, these are called metacarpals. So carpus and metacarpus, getting close, carpal metacarpal would be that joint. So your carpal metacarpal joint between the distal row of the carpals and the top of the uh, metacarpus. Metacarpus has three bones. Those three bones are the cannon bones and the splint bones. Um, here's one where the splint bones are removed. So on this cannon bone, the interosseous ligaments that held the splint bones to the cannon bone did not ossify. But oftentimes they do ossify. And if they do ossify, you could have a splint. So you could have uh, actual a... Uh, uh, growth on the outside of the horse's bone there that the horse the the owner will see or it could just ossify and look pretty normal like that second is medial fourth is lateral we get down the cannon bone the cannon bone is also called the third metacarpal the distal end of the cannon bone makes up the proximal end of your fetlock joint also called your metacarpal phalangeal joint these are phalanges this is the metacarpus again just put those two together quickly on the palmar aspect of your distal metacarpus is your uh Sesmoid bones, the sesmoid bones change the direction of pull for a, for a tendon, so much like a pulley in the crane. Um, they change the direction of pull and they give us a larger area of attachment for different material, for you know your spinter ligament above, sesmoid ligaments below, and they make a lot more surface area in your fetlock joint. Very important bones. The uh, joint between long pastern and short pastern is called your pastern joint or your proximal interphalangeal joint. And the... Uh, uh, this joint is pretty mobile. There's not a lot of movement there. It is a hinge joint and it does have plain joint characteristics, so it's not just one or the other, but it doesn't move a lot. And then you have your coffin joint, which is between um, the distal end of P2 and the proximal end of P3. P3 is your, your coffin bone. Um, this joint has a navicular bone on the back of it. The navicular bone does have an articular aspect, also called a distal sesmoid. Much like these, it increases the area of uh, surface in that joint, as well as changes the direction of pull on the deep flexor tendon. Now, the coffin bone. This is an interesting bone. Uh, it's a distal insertion for both the main extensor and the deep flexor tendon. Uh, it's sharp, like you could actually cut something with that. So if you think about that, to be on the ground and have a sharp edge and it's porous and it's light, it's not a wonder that we sometimes have problems with this bone. It's a wonder we don't have a lot more problems more of the time. It's just that God is pretty clever when he put that exoskeleton on there we call a hoof. Because the hoof continues to grow, continues to protect, and in fact is overbuilt. You'll get a horse with a resection from white line disease, and that horse is still sound and going along without a problem because the foot is so well designed. It's, it's an incredible bone, an incredible foot, just an incredible structure. So that is our... Uh, thoracic limb, bones, and joints. So, Cody, will you do the pelvic limb for us? Absolutely. In the hind limb, if you can remember some initials, that's going to help you get down to your tarsus. The initials to remember for me is PFPFT, and that will take me right down to my tarsus. P being pelvis, F being femur, P being patella, F being fibula, and T being tibia. Okay, now in between these joints, this joint right here between the pelvis and our femur is our coxofemoral joint. Our joint between our femur and our tibia is our femorotibial joint. Now also if you look right here, that's really amazing to me about the hind limb is the way 
that the patella has a large amount of attachments to it. There's three muscles that insert into our patella, and from the patella down, we have three ligaments that attach to the top of our, our tibia. And as those muscles contract, that's what extends this femorotibial joint. Now that'll take us right down to our tarsus, and that'll take it from there. All right. Wally has really small fibulas, doesn't he? He does have very small fibulas. Yeah, I wonder if he's embarrassed. He better be. He better be. <laughs> okay, so now we're, we're back into, the, uh, into our realm. You know, as farriers, the closer to the foot, the more we need to know. And once you have this mastered, then master this, and then you master this, and then you start mastering the muscles and stuff. But uh, uh, you can never learn enough anatomy. I've never we have our, our tibia coming in and hitting the tarsus. The, the tarsus is the equivalent of our heel bones. So if you think of our anatomy compared to a horse, a horse would be standing here, pelvis, femur, patella is our kneecap, fibula and tibia get you right down to the heel. So the heel for us would be the hawk for the horse. Okay, And our ankle bones would be the horse's uh, tarsal bones. Um, really interesting thing here is we have four joints, uh, and the way this joint is oriented and articulates is very incredible. So the tibia comes in and hits the talus, and the talus has these trochlea on it, and they're oriented a little bit to the outside, and they, uh, they allow this a lot of movement right there. That's called the tarsocrural or the tibiotarsal joint. The large bone sticking up here is called our calcaneus, sometimes called the fibular tarsal bone. Uh, it's going to be an insertion for superficial flexor tendon, uh, gas rock comes down here, we have the plantar ligament on it. There's a lot of stuff on this, and because it sits out away from the bones, that changes the leverage and the power that this particular, this particular orientation can create. Between the distal end of our talus and calcaneus, and the top of our central tarsal, and actually the top of our fourth tarsal as well, is going to be our proximal intertarsal joint. Between central tarsal and third tarsal, and really, um, T1 and 2 don't really figure into that as easily, but if you come up around here, uh, you can see where that, that sweeps around uh, central tarsal there. That would be your distal intertarsal joint. And then that's your tarsus is your metatarsus. Between T1 through 4 and the top of your metatarsus will be your tarsal metatarsal joint. So when we get below that, interesting things about the pelvic limb the lateral splint bone is the largest splint bone in the horse. So that would be our fourth metatarsal, lateral being a larger number. And you can see by knowing that, you can see this is a right hind foot, or right hind leg. The medial splint bone is smaller, and then that's called the second metatarsal. Cannon bone is the third metatarsal. From there down, the anatomy is, in common terms or layman's terms, the same as the front. So our fetlock joint, this time is going to be called metatarsal phalangeal. The front was metacarpal phalangeal. This is metatarsal phalangeal. Sesamoids, kind of the same place, same position, same job. The uh, long pastern, larger on top than it is on the bottom, makes up the uh, distal end of the fetlock joint, makes up the proximal end of the pastern joint. P2, the joint between there is called the pastern joint. That joint is called the proximal inner phalangeal. And then our coffin joint with a navicular bone behind it. Coffin joint is between the distal end of P2, proximal end of P3. Uh, navicular bone is also called the distal sesamoid or sometimes the shuttle bone. So that is your pelvic limb. On the average horse, this horse was uh, made by the same guy that made Wally for us. But look at the difference between the length of the cannon bone between those two models. So the front cannon bone on a biomechanically correct horse is shorter than the hind cannon bone.